Hey, this is Paul Vance at GreatDad.com, and I represent the uh, the website GreatDad.com, which has as its whole mission to talk to uh, talk to dads because dads don't always think like moms, and most of the resources out there uh, speak speak for moms, and dads need a voice too. And most of our guests are talking about uh, about fatherhood, and our experts on fatherhood today. I've got a, a double whammy as uh, as I've got a, a guest who could talk to both uh, coaching and positive intelligence, which is a which is a uh, uh, modality that I use in my coaching, and but who is also a father with some experiences to share and how those two things come together. So welcome, uh, Bob Loftus. Uh, welcome, Bob. Thanks, Paul. Great to be here. Really yeah. looking forward to our discussion. So I really, I really enjoy having conversations with other coaches doing positive intelligence and seeing how how the the use of that has changed your coaching. Your, you know, your your coaching uh, skills and experience and your direction, and then also how it's affected you in your daily life. Because I think every one of us coaches who have done it were so affected by it that it's hard for us now to to put it down or put it in a little category of you know this one little area of coaching. So let, let me t- let us hear a little bit about how you came about positive intelligence and and your experience. Well, I first heard about it, oh, two years ago from a former colleague from the high-tech company, Symantec, where we all worked as coaches and um, nobody was there. It was a big layoff and kind of changes happening. It had been a couple of years. Um, This person on the East Coast got in touch and said, I heard about an interesting approach and I'm putting together a small group of coaches to go through an introduction to how it works. Mm -hmm. And um, the the one closest to me who was my master coach when I was learning coaching, more or less of the CTI method, she invited me to join that group. And um, right away I took to it because there's so many things in positive intelligence that resonate with other coaching methods and my own approach to spirituality that just made sense. Uh, And so I've been able to internalize it. And to your point earlier, um, I'd say what I appreciate the most about it is it actually is transformational. That's a word that gets overused. Sure. But I noticed the effect on me was similar to when I first got interested in mindfulness per se, the John Kabat-Zinn mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, That was uh, also recommended by a friend, a therapist, who said, you've been having trouble meditating. I know a better approach for you to try. This was right around the time when I moved my dad from the East Coast to the West Coast in the second stage of Alzheimer's. And anyone who's worked with someone who no longer has their full mental capacity, but used to be a figure of authority, knows how difficult it can be. So I did an approach of just being in the moment with him wherever he needed to go and then sort of guiding him in a safer direction mentally of our conversations. So that made a huge difference to me. And I had the same experience uh, learning positive intelligence within the first couple of weeks that something was changing in the way I lived my life and connected with people and thought about the world, especially given all the pressures we have now, the pandemic, the economy, global wars, you know, there's so much that we're all dealing with. And um, it's been a tremendous help. Yeah, that, that echoes what my experience has been both personally and then also clients. I mean, that's the, that's the, the real proof for us as coaches is we want, we really want to see it a a change in our in our clients based on what we do and several of mine and I and I quite often say this in these because it always comes up but they use words like transformational or or change my you know change my life change my reaction to everyday life and I know that's such a big claim but it is a, it is getting people down on a on a path of a daily practice of being mindful as you say that's you know this it's not it's not something new per se but it's the way it's packaged Getting people to be mindful and choosing to find more positive ways to respond to da- life's daily challenges. It doesn't mean the challenges go away or you just are happy all the time. Just ha- just have a happy thought, but you learn how to 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 
to train your mind and change your reaction, your, your immediate reaction. And if you don't change it immediately, at least you start with that awareness and then you're on the path to changing it. And we're big on forgiveness, knowing that if we don't stay focused and disciplined to do the work, we can fall off the track and make some mistakes we used to make prior to this practice. And the whole point is to be in the moment now and get back on the horse and just keep going, not to live in the past or worry about the future, but do right now things that will make your life better. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I love what you say about uh, dealing with your father, which must have been a challenge. Uh, mindfulness is incredibly valuable for having the patience to get through the, some of those situations, whether it's a small child or a teenager or, uh, or a father going through what you're talking about, because all you have is that moment and, uh, and, and taking on the anxiety and erupting in frustration doesn't do anybody any good. And it is a way to, yeah. to keep yourself under control. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've had some challenges. Uh, unfortunately, we had a major tragedy in my own little family. Uh, my wife died when our daughter was five years old. Oh, uh, she got my wife got sick when she the daughter was four, and then five she was gone with a, a terrible brain cancer that's pretty much unstoppable. And my wife was thirty nine, you know, at the oh. time. And um, I was a first time parent, a little bit older, and uh, I don't think I wanted to accept how awful this was. I mean, it was just beyond my comprehension. But uh, we did have 14 months of trying everything to offset it. So it's almost like how a woman's body changes during pregnancy, that the, the, the way nature works, everything starts, even dads start thinking differently, even though our bodies don't yeah, change. hormones change, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I didn't really want to accept it, but it was inevitable. And my main focus was on my daughter, that she'd be okay. You know, and uh, I tried not to be, well, for sure, not to go over the edge, you know, become a drunk and pound my head against the wall, but just focus on what she would need. Uh, that, you know, was really my expression of love for my wife was to make sure that this is going to work. And um, it really, that focus kept me okay and moving because at the time, I was a manager at Apple Computer, had been for many years, and it was a very stressful job. Yeah. Ultimately, I had to leave that job to get a little bit easier one at Hewlett Packard through a former colleague, uh, a fellow who I really admired, but I had to let him go at Apple. I had laid him off and he hired me at Hewlett Packard. <laughs> and he's must, a dad. Must have, you must have done that layoff right. <laughs> yes, and he's a dad. So we had that in common. Um, and so uh, it wasn't too long after um, my wife passed away that I noticed my daughter was way too smart for the reading problems she was having. So I started researching and pretty much saw that she most likely had dyslexia and that my late wife also had dyslexia. Mm. And, you know, a lot of dyslexia, well, so many people alive have dyslexia and never got an intervention. And so they were judged and ridiculed and told they weren't smart enough and all that. So it's caused so many problems. And now it can be determined pretty inexpensively, but it doesn't get out to enough people. But I managed to get my daughter to a, a well-respected testing facility and then changed her school to one that just focused on helping dyslexia, uh, dyslexia influenced readers. And she spent two years there and it changed the way her brain reads. So she graduated summa cum laude <laughs> a couple of years ago from college. Um, and that was mostly because of determination, I think. Uh, and she loves to read. So um, yeah, it was a challenge. I, um, I thought some of the problems that she uh, had at the time might be related to grief in losing her mom. Right. So it took a little while before it settled in. And it wasn't until um, high school that we discovered she also has the gift of attention deficit 
disorder, which I don't think is a disorder. It's just a different way the brain works. And so that made it a struggle for her. She took some time off after college um, to work on her own. She worked abroad as a nanny in Holland for a year and learned Dutch and had this incredible educational experience, got fired up and came back ready for college. So, um, you know, she was a little older than uh, the kids in her class, but she adapted pretty well to it. So it's been a, a little bit of a journey with her. And uh, I have to say that when I got interested in coaching about 10 years ago, that shifted my attitude and methods as a parent. Yeah, so I, I'm very curious about that, about how you how you in that the, the coaching journey, when you became a coach and you were able to look back on the things that you did, I mean, it sounds like you were organically a very good and focused father, very present. You sound like you did a lot of research trying to, I mean, we all have, you know, we all, we all try our best, but as I think some people are better at it, uh, than others and recognize the problem and doing the research, trying to figure out and solve the best solution when you, but when you became a coach, did, did you learn things that you realize that you were doing organically or do you, did you learn or, and, or did you find other things that you wish, wow, I wish I'd known this coaching <laughs> approach. Yeah. I wish I would have taken the coaching approach sooner. Yeah. Which is, um, you know, uh, in our, one of our PQ groups, we were um, listening to presentations by Dr. William Stixrud about the self-driven child mm -hmm. and that really dovetails nicely with positive intelligence and coaching. It's more about allowing your child to have the responsibility to learn rather than protect them. But I have to say that I was hyper vigilant for those early years. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's laughable, but my ever, you know, uh, I think for the last oh, 22 years, if I cough so much as a loud cough, my daughter says, Dad, are you okay? There's only one of you left. <laughs> like, <laughs> you gotta be okay. So we joke about it now, but that's, you know, that's real, that's serious, that you just worry when things change so uh, dramatically as they did. But yeah, I would say what helps me now with an adult child who's reached the age of true reason of the prefrontal lobes working fully, but still has these challenges of, attention and some of the issues that come with those also, that um, it really helps me feel, um, uh, let's say, satisfied that I'm doing the best I can rather than, you know, can't sleep at night because I didn't do it perfectly. You know, I just every day stay focused on what can I do to help today if I'm needed, you know, and mostly, um, I like one of our um, mentors in positive intelligence, um, Bill Carmody has that book about the principles of a successful marriage. Yeah. And I think that's successful relationships in general. You know, don't keep score, use words of appreciation and don't go to bed angry. Right. And I do remember when my daughter was little, and this is pretty touching, my wife was such a project manager that she had actually um, planned out the first weekend that she would be gone. Oh. Things for us to do that wow. was already scheduled out. And we didn't know, of course, it was going to be the last weekend, but somehow she probably had some instinct. And I was trying to do these things and, and I was just sort of overwhelmed and you know, I was getting irritated. My daughter was pushing my buttons. She was, you know, in a different world. And I looked at her as I got upset and I said, honey, I need a timeout. <laughs> and I went to the bedroom, threw myself down on my bed. And she came in, threw her arms around me and said, daddy, it's going to be okay. Oh. You'll be all right. <laughs> and I think that's another little microcosm that we don't have to be superheroes, you know, we just have to be honest and vulnerable and do our best.
You know? Yeah, I think that's really those are really good words to live by when you when you get on the internet. It's, certainly, the pressures are far higher for women on being you know the best mom, and and even you know, we often joke with the fact that you could never have a website that's called greatmom.com because they all they already get so much of that pressure <laughs> as it is. But men men <laughs> men will you know the 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 bar for us isn't that high to be called a a great dad. Yeah. But in that, what you just said is a, uh, some real gems of uh, wisdom. I think about about how much being present, being present and, and showing up and, you know, doing your best is, you know, that's 99% of the job of being a, a, a parent. And it doesn't have to be so anxiety producing, but you do have to put in the time. Yeah. 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 And that's, I think, why we like the positive intelligence approach, because we know we have to keep our battery charged to stop those routine reactions that we grew up with. And, you know, I think of my father, a farm boy in Texas during the depression. How did he learn parenting? Well, his own father died when my dad was 11 in a farming accident. And, um, you know, they were moving around different parts of the state. Uh, he and his mom and she remarried. And then he was in World War II at the age of 17. And, you know, you don't learn fathering as such. You do learn leadership and brotherhood, that's for sure. Right. Um, but, yeah, and so I grew up in a household in which the women were dominant, but kind of fascinated with this cowboy in New Jersey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and, I th and he was pretty... I think he loved the idea of the matriarchy with a structure that accepted him because he had a strong will and so did my mother. Uh, and, you know, the way things happen often is that often boys will go towards the moms because the moms are around more. Right. You know, you, you, you can trust that the mom will always be there. And I have to say, I adopted this prejudice as a single dad I would always want to make the plan for a play date with the mom because I knew she would be there. If I made it with the dad, work might get in the way or something. <laughs> so uh, we adopt and adapt. And um, yeah, and he presented a very macho influence, maybe as a counteraction. Uh, and my path went away from him and more towards where the women wanted me to go to college, et cetera. But we always had this bond, you know, he was always very um, connected to me. And um, <clears throat> actually, he was an early member of the NRA. And we, I grew up with guns and hunting and then ultimately bows and arrows because I got him interested in that through Boy Scouts, but not AR-15s. Like this was just hunting yeah. where you would use, I, I grew up eating more variations on venison than one can imagine you know well that world has changed a lot that world has totally changed it's a different club altogether <laughs> um yeah but um so it was interesting when my mother passed away and he needed constant care in the mid-stage of alzheimer's i brought him out to california uh and you know my daughter was 10 at the time it was just too much for me working to manage um everything. So I found a really good assisted living in my town and I would see him regularly. And we would have these very different discussions because now he didn't have that macho have to do stuff to prove myself. He would just be sitting around and I'm sure his mind, you know, he's trying to figure out what's happening. But this is when I got into mindfulness. And so I didn't mind just being with him in the moment. And uh, we had interesting discussions. Uh, and this is one of the ways where there's a similarity between uh, dyslexia and uh, Alzheimer's. So my daughter was really good at the age of five in faking out her teachers that she, under she was reading well because she could invent stories based on what she heard the other kids say, you know, and she was very entertaining. So I was, uh, I needed to take my dad for a psychiatric uh, evaluation of his mental condition. And um, we went to see um, 
uh, a friend of the uh, gerontologist that he was seeing, a psychiatrist to do the evaluation. And of course, my dad didn't know where we were really or what was going on, but I, he trusted me. And so I said, dad, we just have to talk to this doctor a little bit. We went in and she was very serious looking across the two of us are sitting on the couch. And she says, you know, we're here where I live in California. James, are you in New Jersey now? And he looks at her somewhat seriously. Then he looks over at me. I'm not giving him any hints. He looks back at her and he goes, are you? <laughs> I about fell out of the seat. So did she, as serious as she was. And I thought, this is it. You know, most of us agree, you know, like we like people who agree with us. Right. And, you know, with having trouble reading chapter books, you can fake it a little bit to take the attention away. And so he had been faking it that he, his brain was changing for quite a while and he was really skilled at it. Yeah. So uh, I, I, it further uh, gave me appreciation for the amazing power of our brain to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you, that, to bring it back to positive intelligence, yeah. that's one of the, 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 the ahas about positive intelligence is, is based on the changing uh, understanding of brain plasticity and that we can rewire our brain, brains, which, you know, 30 years ago was not thought of as completely impossible. And now we know that we can do that. So that that kind of leads us into the, what we said we would give give a hint to, which is what one of the exercises we use in positive intelligence, because part of positive intelligence, as I said, is is, is rewiring the brain, retraining the brain to ha to find a more positive response. So we do these things called PQ exercises, which can go from anywhere from a minute to I don't know, 12, 15 minutes. I guess they could be longer, but it's really the act of trying. It's, it's a mindfulness exercise, not unlike any kind of other meditation, but part of, part of that is changing your, your, your brain structure. And you said you have a, you had, a, you have a different type of exercise that you invented or you, that you found somewhere else that you could, you could demo for us. Sure. Um, yeah. I invite the uh, listeners or viewers. I'll speak it as I, as I, um, guide, uh, but this is one of a, a number of practices called havening, like in a safe haven. Mm -hmm. And this one is always pretty popular with groups that I work with. And um, you can't do it in the middle of a Zoom meeting in business, but you can do it before the meeting or if you're starting to get upset about something with a partner, a friend, and you realize I just got to bring myself back out of this kind of game that's going on in my head. So um, you can do this with your eyes open or closed, and it involves crossing your arms over so that your fingers are on your opposite shoulders and slowly move down, move your fingers down your arms all the way to your elbows. And when you get to your elbows, you work your way back and you just go slowly noticing the sensations of your fingertips and on your shirt usually or your sweater uh, or if you're bare skinned even better for that sensation and you get into um, a just kind of easy relaxed way of breathing and for me it doesn't take too long before I give a pretty big exhale <laughs> because that's kind of the nature of it. And um, one of the great advantages of this one is that it brings us into the moment and back home, the only place where we ever truly live. That's with our body. So uh, you can do this for a few minutes. Uh, I hope you're finding it relaxing but I'm going to have to stop because I might fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there are a few others. They're very similar to um, the exercises that we do with positive intelligence. And just to emphasize what you were saying, Paul, why I think I took to it so much is that there's no emphasis on some sort of you know, spiritual enlightenment or deep meditation. It's really just um, you and your body connecting into 
the moment and being fully alert and awake uh, and observant of what's going on in the world right around you in the moment now. And that's what I think uh, my clients have appreciated the most. For instance, I do work with some moms who have rebellious teenage daughters <laughs> who are really causing them a problem or extended family members from multiple marriages and everybody's got their own situation going on. And I realized the main thing is to help the person go home and know their boundaries and what can they actually do and not be judging themselves for being perfect for everybody but just good enough to do the job responsibly that shows how much affection she has, even if it doesn't come back. Yeah. You know, to honestly just express out what she feels to different people who might be problematic to her or to the dad. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it's been really popular with a lot of my uh, dad clients is that it does, it is very practical. It is based on uh, upon a lot of science and it takes some of those things that maybe we've traditionally kind of thought of being a little bit too woohoo or a little California, but it's because it's been, it, because it's now based on a lot of things that have been tried and true for a long time. I mean, MRIs will, will confirm that there is something changing in the brain. So that is really interesting to men. And it has this whole practical application to all kinds of situations involved with your, your career and business, as well as your, as, as well as your family and your other type of relationships. I do want to make sure that we talk about one thing that you've been, you've been doing some pro bono work with positive intelligence, specifically with the incarcerated community and how that has uh, that's kind of the intersection of positive intelligence coaching and and then fatherhood because a lot of these men are away from their kids and are trying to maintain those relationships. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Oh, sure. I um, started a, a group of uh, what my daughter informed me are called returned citizens. Mm -hmm. And they were formerly incarcerated and uh, unfortunately, if you do a little bit of study, you see it's very hard to be in that situation and not carry the burden of that judgment for the rest of your life and actually legal limits like not being able to vote, harder to get a job, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, I, um, I, I somehow got interested in this. It might have been because of George Floyd, I, I, I don't know what it was, the Black Lives Matter movement, but something got to me and then I made some connections and I had four um, members of a small group I took through positive intelligence, three dads and one mom, and they had all spent a good deal of their life in prison, missing their families. And one I've continued working one-on-one -on -one with uh, who spent a very long time, much of it in solitary confinement and much of it uh, needing to be a gang member in the prison to survive because that's the way it works in our prisons. Uh, and he really took to positive intelligence because everything that we focus on is exactly what was what he was struggling with coming out. So he already had some inclinations that he could help the world and that he wanted to, and probably some awareness of the inner person that never got to come out because his father was very abusive, but doing it in the form of love, training him to be an athlete, but just absorbing too much pain for a little kid. So anyway, he grew up thinking love and pain, you know, enduring it and giving it out were all kind of mixed together. And uh, what he has appreciated so much is the awareness of these tricksters in his brain that come on. Uh, and this is pretty common with people who've been in that prison system state of mind because you have to watch your back all the time. Trust is limited depending on the kind of pr prison you're in. And then uh, you're always um, vigilant about where you are, who's with you, do you have a backup plan, are you protected? 
And so you're afraid a lot of the time, but yet you look tough and you could give it out badly uh, if anyone, you know, got you going and you were in a safe place to fight back. So anyway, I've so admired how he has changed his life and truly it is transformation. And he still struggles. He still knows that that judgment is always running in his head. You know, you shouldn't have done what you did. It means that you're rotten to the core. You'll never change. Those thoughts come and he just catches them and says, why am I thinking that? Well, you know, we've talked through the path that he had to follow that inevitably would lead him to that situation he was in. And now that he's not on that path, he's not going in that way. In fact, um, he is helping other people who have issues, you know, around addiction that get them into prison and keep them going back. And he's developed a really good family support system. And he's trying to work it out with his children who, um, you know, felt abandoned, of course, that he was not around a lot. And that is, um, it's a challenging one. I think, you know, we just have to realize that you need to show up a lot in order to overcome that lack of trust that people have built up about you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's part also, the central part of positive intelligence is is dealing with the what you call it, what you're saying is the judge, this, these voices that come out and and getting you to uh, realize what they are, what why they why they say the things they do. Like in, the, in this case, I'm sure the hype, we we call a hyper vigilant sa- a saboteur who's always saying everybody around you is out to get you, and that may have been true when he was incarcerated, and now he has to relearn how to react to the world without going to that that's that space because it would be ultimately destructive to his life on the outside if he suspects everybody is going to attack him but you can imagine how that plays out in any other part of life where you are overreacting or overachieving or whatever the number of saboteurs are that you have living inside you who uh who, who say these words that in some way are helpful to you they're evolutionarily important to protect you but in overdrive they can be destructive Yeah. And, you know, that one we talk about the controller, you know, so if you have to protect yourself, you need to control your environment or everything will fall apart. And so sometimes we see people who just seem oppressive that, you know, they want to know everything about the situation and make sure nothing changes. And we resent it and judge them when if we thought, oh, they're probably really worried that if they don't do that, things won't be good, that the world will fall apart, that people will be in pain. This is not necessarily a a negative um, um, uh, motive that it comes from. It's just a way of dealing with trouble. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has really been very, uh, very interesting hearing about your your coaching and positive intelligence. And and I'm really excited about the work you're doing with the, the, um, what you you said there recently, uh, re- yeah, returned citizens. Returned citizens. <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's just it's, like illegal immigrant, you know, <laughs> or illegitimate child. I mean, I grew up with all this stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, there's old fashioned ways of. Uh, and you, you know, it just comes with such a prejudice in it. Yeah, exactly. It's such a cultural thing. But then you think, is a child illegitimate? Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. really? <laughs> So you can find more about uh, more about Bob and his practice at uh, nowforward.biz, as well as a link to how to reach you and uh, your LinkedIn profile. And uh, you can find me at paulbanuscoaching.com. And if you want to learn more about positive intelligence at uh, greatdad.com slash PQ. So Bob, thanks again for uh, spending some time with me and we'll see you all next time. Take care, Paul.